At first glance, Macbeth can be a very daunting play to study, as it is not immediately easy to understand the language used or the context in which it was written. However, Shakespeare's works have remained relevant for such a long time largely due to the timelessness of the themes, such as ambition and guilt. They are absolutely essential to understanding the play as a whole, because themes in literature help the author to convey a message to the audience and give meaning to the character's actions. In this video, we will be looking at three major themes in Macbeth which are closely linked. The supernatural, fate versus free will, and appearance versus reality. Since the witches have the opening lines of the play, when shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain? It is clear that the supernatural will have great significance in this story. At the time this play was written, the general public had a fascination with witches, ghosts, and all things mystical and magical. Even the reigning king at the time, James I, had a keen interest in supernatural beings and wrote a book on it. So by incorporating this theme into Macbeth, Shakespeare is referencing popular culture and also providing an element of mystery and fear for his audience, who would have believed in the existence of the paranormal in their everyday lives. Despite these beliefs, the supernatural is not presented as absolute fact in this play, but with enough room for skepticism that it is up to us to determine the extent of their reality. Banquo displays this doubt from the start when he and Macbeth meet the witches in Act 1, Scene 3, asking, Are ye fantastical, or that indeed which outwardly ye show? He does not trust their prophecies and even warns his companions not to be deceived by their riddles and half-truths, as it is likely to end badly. Macbeth is aware of this danger, and he says to himself, This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. He is no fool and knows it is not wise to fraternize with dark supernatural forces, but he goes against his better judgment to serve his ambition. In Act 4, Scene 1, the witches open with a long ritualistic chant that involves them combining a large number of horrific ingredients, mostly body parts, to make their brew. It also includes the very famous lines, Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. They are indicating that Macbeth's troubles are going to be doubly worse from here on out, and reinforcing the audience's disgust towards their stereotypically witchy behaviour. Additionally, we can see how desperate Macbeth must be at this point to purposely seek out these evil women for advice and reassurance. Because he has blinded himself to their deceitful nature, he ignores the warning signs given to him at every point and clings on to their prophecies until the last. This choice costs him everything, including his life. Through the witches and Macbeth's interactions with them, Shakespeare is warning the audience not to let a fascination for evil supernatural powers overrule your sense of reason. Like her husband, Lady Macbeth has an attraction to the dark side, and almost immediately invokes their help in her mission to kill Duncan. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell. She is taking it a step further than her husband by actually asking these spirits to possess her and make her a cold-blooded killer, which would have been both terrifying and shocking to the audience at the time. Her later descent into madness, therefore, could potentially be attributed to the influence of dark spirits, although it is more likely due to her repressed guilt and paranoia. For a more in-depth study of Lady Macbeth, check out this character analysis video. It is important to remember, however, that there are not only dark supernatural forces referenced in this play, and Duncan as a divinely appointed king is often mentioned in association with God and Heaven. Macbeth says that murdering Duncan would essentially condemn his soul because his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. Later, Macduff, as the avenger of the king's death, seeks help from God to destroy Macbeth. Gentle heavens, cut short all intermission. Front to front, bring thou this fiend of Scotland and myself. Within my sword's length, set him. Shakespeare is using the supernatural to define the main character's morals, because even today, regardless of personal beliefs, we have an ingrained habit of associating heaven with good and hell with bad. While Shakespeare may have written Macbeth to indulge his audience's fascination with the supernatural, 
it also encourages them not to discard logic and reason, and to stay within society's moral boundaries. The theme of fate versus free will is closely linked to the supernatural, particularly the witch's prophecies, and raises the question of whether our lives are governed by fate or whether we are able to create our own destiny. At first glance, it may seem that Macbeth is fated to kill King Duncan, and later to die at the hands of Macduff, but there are many instances in this play where he seems to willingly take matters into his own hands in order to achieve his goals. At the beginning of the play, when King Duncan is receiving news of the battle, the messenger says, But all's too weak for brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel which smoked with bloody execution. From this description, it seems that Macbeth was fated to lose the battle, but his determination and bravery changed the outcome and won the day. He is a man who has turned the tide of battle despite the odds being stacked against him, and has made a good name for himself as a result. However, when he encounters the witches, they hail him as Thane of Cawdor, Macbeth that shall be king hereafter. And he becomes fixated on the idea of becoming king, especially once he receives word of his promotion to Thane of Cawdor. Although the thought has crossed his mind, he does not immediately decide to murder King Duncan, and remains conflicted, saying, if chance will have me king, why, chance may crown me without my stir. He is hoping that fate will give him the throne of Scotland, without him having to take any drastic actions to get it. Unfortunately, this does not happen, and Malcolm is named as the heir to the Scottish throne, prompting Macbeth to go through with the murder after all. As he prepares for this, he sees a vision of a bloody dagger that supposedly points towards the king's bedchamber. Thou marshalest me the way that I was going. We could interpret this in two ways. It could be that a supernatural power is guiding him towards his destiny, and giving him the final push that he needs to carry out the deed. Alternatively, the dagger could be a manifestation of the anxiety and guilt he must have felt at that moment. He would be rebelling against the natural order by committing regicide, and perhaps the dagger is a convenient excuse that his brain has concocted in order to persuade himself that he is being controlled by fate. If you found this video helpful so far, hit the like button below, it really helps out the channel. In Act 3, Scene 1, as Macbeth decides whether or not he should kill his friend Banquo, fate is mentioned again. He says, For Banquo's issue have I filed my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered, to make them kings, the seed of Banquo kings. Rather than so, come fate into the list and champion me to the utterance. Rather strangely, he wants fate to champion him or fight for him in his mission, but if he truly believed in the witch's prophecies, Banquo's descendants were meant to one day sit on the throne, so he would actually be fighting against fate with this action. Banquo is murdered, but his son Fleance is able to escape the assassin sent by Macbeth. This seems to prove that the witches hold some power in controlling destiny. However, we never find out if Fleance or any of Banquo's descendants ever actually take the throne, so it is very possible that it is simply Banquo's sacrifice and a bit of luck that saves his son, rather than any supernatural intervention. One of the biggest arguments in favour of fate are the three apparitions shown to Macbeth by the witches in Act 4, Scene 1. They tell him first to beware Macduff, second, that no man born of a woman can kill him, and third, that he cannot be defeated until Burnham Wood marches against his castle in Dunsinane. Macbeth ignores the first warning, and interprets the other two prophecies to mean that he is safe, as it is seemingly impossible for either of these events to occur. He is duped by their half-truths, and is stunned when both of the prophecies come true in a rather anticlimactic fashion. Burnham Wood marches against Dunsinane, but it is not an epic Lord of the Rings-style march of the Ents, but merely Malcolm and his men holding tree branches in front of them to hide the number of men in their army. Macduff, who was from his mother's womb untimely ripped, defeats Macbeth, but he is not some superhuman being, just a man who was born through a c-section. If fate really had a hand in how the prophecies played out, it would seem that Macbeth is a victim of a cruel cosmic joke. Alternatively, however, it is possible that rather than controlling his destiny, the witches have simply manipulated Macbeth into doing what they wanted under the disguise of it being his fate. He may have even succeeded in turning the tide of battle like he did in King Duncan's army, had he not taken the witch's words as absolute truth. 
When Macduff reveals his birth story, Macbeth admits that it has cowed my better part of man. So although he puts up a fight, in his heart he feels he has already been defeated. It is up to the audience to decide whether they believe that Macbeth's story was brought about by fate or free will. But looking at the author's life, it is possible that he may have favoured the idea of free will. Shakespeare was not born into nobility or university educated, but through the strength of his intelligence and hard work, managed to become a leading playwright with a patronage from the king himself. From this perspective, it is likely that Shakespeare was trying to convey to his audience that every man is responsible for his own actions and the consequences which follow. Right at the start of the play, the witches chant, Fair is foul, and foul is fair, which gives us an early warning that everything is not always as it appears. Soon afterwards, Macbeth says something very similarly worded, So foul and fair a day I have not seen. And this deja vu moment suggests that he will be connected to the witches and their deceptions throughout the story. Macbeth and his wife must often put on a front around other people in order to hide their true thoughts and intentions. While plotting to kill King Duncan, she tells Macbeth, Your face, my thane, is a book. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He is not naturally disposed to hiding his emotions, but must now put on a show of loyalty to avoid suspicion. The king is among those that are fooled by this facade, as when he arrives at Macbeth's castle, he says it has a pleasant seat, and calls Lady Macbeth fair and noble hostess. There's a lot of dramatic irony here as the audience knows that she and her husband had planned to murder him that very night. The performance continues even after King Duncan's body is discovered by Macduff, and Lady Macbeth even faints in order to divert attention away from her husband. However, the stress of hiding their true faces is too great for either of them to handle, and may explain some of the hallucinations and apparitions that trouble them both. Macbeth is the first to see one of these visions, as he is preparing to murder King Duncan. It appears to be a bloody dagger pointing towards the king's bedroom, and Macbeth is unable to tell whether it is real or not. Are thou not fatal vision sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain? It is unclear whether this is a supernatural symbol or a manifestation of Macbeth's nervous mental state but it is not the only vision he sees. Banquo's ghost also haunts him on the night of his banquet, which hugely distresses him and triggers a breakdown in front of all of his guests. However, he is the only one who can see this apparition, so it is again doubtful whether this is really Banquo's spirit risen from the grave, or a manifestation of Macbeth's guilt. Lady Macbeth scolds him for his fear, saying, Oh, proper stuff, this is the very painting of your fear. This is the air-drawn dagger which you said led you to Duncan. But ironically, at the end of the play, she is the one plagued by hallucinations of blood on her hands that can never be washed clean. Both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth hide the reality of their intentions behind the false persona they want others to see. But this outward show eventually affects their mental state, as the lines between appearance and reality are gradually blurred, leading to their shared demise. Thanks for watching, guys! Hit the like button below and subscribe to my channel for more content. See you next time!